12 as we continue looking at the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 12, we'll be looking at verses 18 through 27, what Pastor Michael just read a few moments ago. If you would bow with me and let's pray. Lord, we come before you at this time. We are celebrating, Lord. We're celebrating your faithfulness, Lord. We are celebrating your goodness. We're celebrating your love, Lord. And Lord, we come to you, Lord, in this mindset that you are good, that you are faithful. We come to you, Lord, looking to understand your word, to know your word, to be transformed by your word. Open up our hearts, open up our minds. Fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Allow us to truly hear from you today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Back in 2015, there was a funeral home in South Carolina that actually opened a coffee shop inside the funeral home itself. Um, it actually was stocked with Starbucks coffee. It had a fireplace. It had a, had a TV. And the owner said the reason why he opened up the coffee shop inside the funeral home because he was trying to give support and trying to ease some of the loss of the people who were mourning. And that really does sound good, but it's questionable to open up a coffee shop inside a funeral home, right? I mean, you know, you're just wondering what was the thought process behind that. And you're not alone. The Week magazine, which is a nationally syndicated magazine, got a hold of this, and they asked their readers to suggest some possible names for the coffee shop that is in a funeral home. A couple of the possible uh, names for the shop were, number one, the Grim Roaster. <laughs> number two, the, the Lost Cup. Excuse me, the Last Cup. Uh, number three, Decoffinated. <laughs> <laughs> this one's my favorite. I can't believe it didn't win. I love that. Uh, ben Nice Knowing You. Being Nice Knowing You. See you Latte. And the winner of the contest was Time to Meet Your Mocha. <laughs> now listen, w one thing that most people do understand is the reality of death. Death is something that we don't like to talk about, something we don't like to admit, but most people accept that death is a reality, it's going to happen. It's really not debatable. But the afterlife, now that's a different conversation. Most religions have some type of view of the afterlife. What happens after this life? What comes next? Most people have a view of what comes next, and they're not afraid to share it with you. Most folks that you know, most folks probably will believe there is in an afterlife. There is some type of paradise. There is some type of better status that comes after this one in which they would spend eternity with a God. Even though they don't have a relationship with that God right now, they still for some reason believe they're going to spend eternity with that God. Some people actually believe in reincarnation, that you are coming back time and time after again as another person or as another being, as another life, uh, until you finally get it right and end that existence. Some people actually will believe that eternity is more of an eternal communion with a nameless, faceless universe. Some people think this is just a crazy argument to begin with because there is no afterlife at all. This is all that there is. And other people are just too busy to talk about it. they got so much going on in this world, they really haven't thought about if something comes next. Well, in our passage today, Jesus weighs in. And Jesus says, there is an afterlife. And there is no debate. It's just a truth that's to be accepted. And the afterlife really is contingent on the power of God. And whether or not you're going to be with him in that afterlife depends what you think about Jesus Christ. That's what we see in our passage today. In Mark chapter 12, verses 18 through 27, Jesus rebukes the Sadducees' view that there is no afterlife. Today we're going to look at this passage, and first we're going to see and talk about the Sadducees, and then we're going to talk about uh, the question, the question they have for Jesus, and then we're going to talk about Jesus' answer, how he answers that question. And then we're going to talk about how it applies to each of us today. And today if you're a Christian, what this passage should help you to understand is that the afterlife is greater than what you and I can imagine. So when you talk about it, talk about it the way the Bible describes it, not what anyone else has told you. 
talk about the way the Bible describes it. And today, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, well, this passage should help you understand that there is an afterlife. And whether or not you're going to expend that afterlife in the presence of God depends whether or not you're going to come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. So as we begin this morning, let's look at the context. Let's look at the background for our passage. Let's see how our passage fits in the flow of the book of Mark and in the Bible. Our passage is in the book of Mark, and Mark is an account of the gospel, meaning it's a telling of the good news, the good news that Jesus, through his work on the cross, will offer to anyone who comes to him in faith rescue from their separation from God. The book of Mark simply is saying that how you respond to Jesus is going to make all the difference. Now, our passage is part of a larger section that begins in chapter 11, verse 1, and goes to chapter 13, verse 37. And our passage is really right in the middle of the Passion Week, the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry before his death, burial, and resurrection. It all begins on Sunday with Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem where he declares that he is God and King, that he is Messiah, and he's doing it in a way that everybody understands, and then he goes to the temple and he looks around. And then in the 12, go back to Bethany. On Monday morning, he gets up from Bethany, he's heading back into Jerusalem, and he curses a fig tree that's not bearing fruit. And then he goes to the temple, to the court of Gentiles, And he clears out the place, getting rid of everyone who's changing money, everyone who's selling sacrificial animals, because it wasn't supposed to be a place of selfishness and self-centeredness. It was supposed to be a place of prayer and evangelism to the nations. And at the end of the day, Jesus goes back to Bethany. Tuesday morning, he gets up. He and the twelve, they're heading back into the temple, into Jerusalem, and they pass by the tree that's now dead, and Jesus takes time to teach on faith and prayer, and forgiveness. And then he goes to the temple, and he's immediately confronted by the religious leaders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders. And they say, Jesus, who do you think you are? What business, what power do you have, what authority do you have to shut down the temple like you did yesterday? And Jesus' response is to expose their heart their selfishness, their self-centeredness, that they're not following God, they're, they're far from God. And he does that by questioning about John the Baptist's ministry and teaching the parable of the wicked vine dressers or the wicked tenants. So you understand that the religious leaders, they hated Jesus, they warned him gone because he was a threat to their power, to their authority, to the status quo. And so what they wanted him to do really was to incriminate himself, to say something that he could be arrested for, or to say something that the crowds would turn their back on. So they tried to trap Jesus, but they weren't successful. So they left. They weren't finished. They sent the Pharisees and the Herodians, and they came and asked Jesus a political question about taxation. They, true too, were trying to trap Jesus, but they couldn't. And today, as we come into our passage, we see in verse 18, the third group who now comes to trap Jesus. It is the Sadducees, and they come with a theological question. They come with a different stance, a theological question. Now, for the Sadducees, you need to understand this group, that during the time of Jesus, they were not numerically large. They weren't a really big Big group by numbers, but they had power in politics, and they had power in religion. They controlled the majority of the seats in the Sanhedrin, or the ruling council in Jerusalem. They were in control of most of the priests. They had great influence, but the crowds didn't like them. They were the urban, the wealthy, the elite, everything the crowds were not. So why did the Sadducees hate Jesus? What was their beef? with Jesus. Well, the same that the teachers of the law had, and the chief priest had, and the elders had, and the Pharisees had, and the Herodians had. They liked the status quo. 
They like their power. They like their authority, and they wanted to keep it. And so their idea was, if we can embarrass Jesus, if we can show that his teaching is flawed, if we can show that we're smarter than he is and our teaching is better than he is, then the crowds will now turn their back on Jesus and everything will go back to the way it once was. Now, it's important to also understand that the Sadducees only believed in the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis to Deuteronomy. They believed in the Torah, the law, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch. They thought that this was the only inspired scriptures. They rejected the writings like Psalms and Job. They rejected the prophets like uh, uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Only the first five books of the Old Testament were God's word. So if you couldn't find it in there, then it wasn't truly theology. It wasn't God's teaching. So they rejected a lot of views that other people would have accepted. One view that they objected was the afterlife. They did not believe there was going to be a bodily resurrection. They did not believe in the immortality of the soul. They did not believe there was anything after this life. When your body died, everything else died. It was over. This was it. That was their view because they said you can't find any proof for it in the first five books of the Old Testament. And that was the view that they were going to attack Jesus with. That was the view that they were going to defend in front of him. That was the view that they were going to embarrass him with. Because keep in mind, Jesus has already said in chapter 8, 9, and 10, three times he has said, I will rise from the dead. So they come to him to defend this issue. So as we get into verses 19 through 23, we see the question, the well-crafted question that the Sadducees come to attack Jesus. They're the next group up. They're next to the plate. The Pharisee and the Herodians have left, and now they're up, and they're ready to come at Jesus. And they go, Jesus, we've got a question for you. And this question is actually born out of a provision made for widows in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. In this passage, it says... That if a woman is married to a man and that man dies and they have no children, then that man's brother needs to marry this woman. And in that, they will A, provide for her and take care of her, and B, keep the family name and the family line going for her brother. This was a provision for widows. Now, for those of you with brothers, and you have sisters-in-law, Just let that mull over for a few minutes. (laughs) Praise God for Jesus, right? I mean, that's... So this was the provision. This was a protection for the widows. You have to understand this was good for them. So if not, they would have been left abandoned. So this was a protection for them. So the Sadducees take this, and they take this understanding, and they come to Jesus, and, and they come to him really with a hypothetical and a really extreme situation. I mean, this is not really rational. It's a hypothetical and extreme situation. They go, hey, Jesus, there's this lady, and she marries this one guy, and this guy dies, and then she marries the next brother, because that's what you're supposed to do, and he dies, and then she marries the next brother, and then he dies. And he goes through all seven brothers until the lady finally dies, and praise God, with all that marriage, I think she'd want to tap out anyway, but... Seven marriages, and we do not have any children. So here's the question. What does happen in the afterlife? What happens in the resurrected life? Whose wife is she? And as we hear that question, from the bottom of our heart, we say, who cares? That's a dumb question. I mean, it really is. And what you need to understand is that's the point. During this time, there was a a debate technique that said if there was a commonly held view that you knew was wrong, you take that view and create an absurd situation. And in creating an absurd situation, you point to this view is completely wrong. Understand in this time period, the common view of the afterlife, the common view that the crowds had, the common view of the people... The common view of the followers of God was that the afterlife was like this life just a little better. 
that the afterlife was this life, just a little more improved. That was the common view of the afterlife. And the Sadducees are saying, that's just dumb. God's too smart for that. If the afterlife is just a little bit better than this life, if the afterlife is just like this life and improved, then there's a lot of problems that are going to happen. There's a lot of problems that are going to take place. So obviously the view of the afterlife can't be true because that view would just be a train wreck. Now from their point of logic, that's a smart debate. From their point of logic, that's a great question. From that point of logic, that's a hard question to answer. And I think they had to feel pretty good about themselves at that point. But then in verses 24 through 27, we see the answer. We see Jesus' answer to this question. And simply, Jesus' answer to this question is, you guys are just wrong. I mean, that's what he's, he says. Hey, congratulations. You have unequivocally, totally, completely got this wrong on all sides. You should be good about yourself. You should be proud. Jesus says, you do not understand the scriptures. Therefore, you do not understand the power of God. Therefore, you are completely wrong. Ouch, that's got to hurt. Because these guys, they are the theological elite. They feel they are the teachers of Scripture. And what Jesus is saying, what you think you do best, you actually know the least. He, he looks at him and he goes, you don't understand God's Word. You don't understand the Scripture. Therefore, you have a distorted view of God. And because you have a distorted view of God, you don't understand God's power. You are just wrong. And so Jesus, in his response, he corrects the view of the afterlife in two basic ways. He addresses the common view and the Sadducees' view. He addresses the afterlife in two basic ways. The first way is this, is that he combats the view that's commonly held that the afterlife is just a continuation of this life. And Jesus goes, nope. The afterlife is not a continuation of this life. The afterlife is not this life only better. The afterlife is something that you do not understand. It is far better than what you can imagine. Jesus starts off in verse 25 and he says, you guys got it all wrong. He says, there's not going to be any marriage in heaven. You're going to be like the angels who do not marry and do not have children. It's going to be something completely different. So why is there not going to be any marriage in heaven? Well, we know from Genesis chapter 1 through 28, one of the big reasons for marriage is procreation, that we may fill the earth with our offspring. But when you get to heaven, when you get to the afterlife, there's no more dying, so there's no more need. Genesis chapter 2 in verses 15 and chapter uh, 18 we, uh, excuse me, uh, chapter eight, Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 and verse 25, we see that one of the reasons that we have marriage is for companionship. But when you get to heaven, we're going to be surrounded with our forever brothers and sisters. We're going to be with those who have gone before us. We're going to be in the presence of God the Father and experience joy and unity forever with Him. We don't need marriage. In Ephesians chapter 5, we see that marriage is a symbol for Christ's love of the church. When we get to the afterlife, we don't need any more symbols for Christ's love. We can go to his presence and experience ourselves. Jesus is saying that the afterlife is nothing like this. It's not a continuation of this life. It's not something just a little bit better, a little more improved. It's something totally different different and the reason why you don't get it is because you do not know the power of God do not limit God to our understanding do not limit God to what we can imagine do not limit God to what only we can think and see you don't know because you don't know the scriptures 
and you don't know the power of God. Heaven, eternal life, the resurrected life, it ain't like this. Praise God, it ain't like this. The second point, or the second way he creates the, or, or, or corrects the view of the afterlife is that he goes directly at the Sadducees and he says, it's real. It's not debatable, it's not questionable, it's, it, it's just real. It doesn't matter really what you think or what you believe, it's real. It's reality, it, 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 it happens, it exists. It starts off in in verse 25, and I love it when Jesus says, he says, for when they rise from the dead, he doesn't say if they rise, he he said, or if it's possible they could rise, he says when they rise. It's a definite, he's staking his claim already in the ground. But then we understand that that Jesus is really promoting this, and this really should be a common view. He, he comes out strong, and technically it really is, because the Old Testament does talk about the afterlife. In Isaiah 26, Ezekiel 34, and Job 19, and Daniel 12, the Psalms are full of it. Uh, in Psalm 16, Psalm 49, Psalm 73, and the list goes on and on. But see, the problem with this is that everything that I've told you is in the prophets and the writings. The Sadducees, they only believed in the first five books of the Bible. If it wasn't in Genesis through Deuteronomy, then it didn't exist. It's not a problem for Jesus. He just pops them in the mouth where they live. He says, let me talk to you about Exodus 3. You, you've read Exodus 3, right? It's, it's the burning bush account. I mean, you want to talk about the first five books of the Bible? Jesus is saying, well, I wrote it, so I'll be glad to talk to you about it. If you remember the burning bush account, it's the account where God reveals himself to Moses as a burning bush. And God speaks to Moses, and he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And he says, God's not the God of of the dead, he's the God of the living. What does that mean? Well, God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac. He says, I am. And at the time he talks to Moses, these three guys have long since been physically dead. They're not around anymore. But God says, I am still their God. They are still with me. They are still alive. They're still in my presence. I am their God, Jesus says. He's the God of the living, not the dead. What Jesus is saying is, is that you fail to take into account that when God has a relationship with someone, that this eternal God's love does not end when somebody physically dies. His love is forever. His love is continual. His love is permanent. And that the afterlife, the eternal life, the resurrected life is not contingent on a person. It's not contingent on their ability. It's contingent on the power of God. So Jesus is saying, hey, boys, in your ignorance and in your arrogance, you have missed something pretty essential. An eternal, holy God is faithful to his people. And his love is forever. And physical death cannot separate you from him. So Jesus says, There is an afterlife, and it's not debatable. It's about God. So as we look at that and we see what Jesus is teaching and what he's saying, the question that we have is, how can it apply to us? What application can we make in our lives? Well, one thing that everyone here needs to embrace, I think, is, is something we rarely talk about, but... But this same Jesus, this is the same Jesus who taught about the resurrection, actually experienced it. See, Jesus defeated death. Jesus arose from the grave. Jesus exploded from the grave. His tomb is still empty. So what he taught, he proved. And the same power of God that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power of God that will raise you and I from the dead as well. So the afterlife's a reality. See, if you know that and embrace that, then we really can make a good application. 
So this morning, you may not be a Christian, you may not be a believer, and you may be confused about what you think about the afterlife, about the resurrected life. You, you may not really understand what you think. You may believe that, that you're going to be in the presence of God even though you do not have a relationship with Him right now. Or you may think there is no afterlife. It's just something that people make up to scare one another. Or, or you, you may think, you know what, uh, I'm really too busy to talk about this. I, I'll deal with this at the, at the end when I'm closer to it. Well, let me tell you about the reality of the afterlife from Jesus himself. That it's true. It's real. The afterlife, the resurrected life are true, and it's real. And everyone will spend somewhere in the afterlife. Some will spend eternity in the presence of God in the new heavens and new earth. And some will spend eternity separated from God in a real place called hell. And Jesus says, where you'll be depends on how you respond to me. That's the reality. But let me tell you another reality. And that's that God loves you. You may not know it. You may not believe it. You may not think you deserve it. But he loves you based on who he is, not who you are. And Colossians 1.16 tells us that you were made, you were created to know that love and to experience that love forever. That's why you're here. That's why you're made. That's God's plan for you for all eternity, for the afterlife, to know and experience his love now and forever. And you may be thinking, well, why don't I experience that love? Why don't I experience his presence? And the reason is, is because you have rejected him. God has not rejected you. You have rejected him. You've rejected his love, his presence, his power in your life because you want to be in control. You want to go after your wants and your will and your ways. You have chosen to be your God. And when you choose to be your God, you choose to be eternally separated from him. And I'll tell you something you already know. You can't fix it. Because you've tried. We all did. You can't rescue yourself. You can't fix the separation. You can't earn God's love. It doesn't matter how good you think you are or how many good things you do to the people around you. You can't earn it. And that's why Jesus, God the Son, in his love for you, died on the cross for your rebellion, paying the debt that you cannot pay. So that if you come to him in faith, believing that he is God, and believing that his death on the cross is sufficient for the forgiveness of your sins, then he will redeem you. He'll buy you back from sin and death. He will rescue you from your separation because he's the only one who can. And he'll reconcile you to God forever. And that's what he is inviting you to do today. If you'll stop running away from him and turn back to him believing that Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do, then he will rescue you. And he will give you the assurance that his love for you starts now but it will go on forever. And nothing can separate you from that love. That's the promise of an eternal God. This morning, I encourage you to accept the offer of the one true God to come to him through faith in Christ so that you will know that now and forever you will be in his presence. And you'll never have to worry about the afterlife ever again. Well, Christian, what about us? I mean, we already buy into the afterlife, praise God. We already know what's coming. We're excited about it, right? I mean, this is usually not an issue for us. But let me ask you this. How do you explain the afterlife? How do you explain heaven to those around you? 
Because let's be honest, there is a world around us that's confused about what comes next. There's a world around us that has a lot of views about what comes next. There's a world around us that has no idea about what comes next. So how are you explaining the afterlife? How are you explaining the resurrected life? How are you explaining heaven to those around you? You know, most of the time, the way we explain it is the way that people believed in Jesus' days, that it's just a continuation of this life, just a little bit better. It's a continuation of this life, a little more improved, because we say when we get to heaven, we're going to do this, and we're going to go here, and we're going to get this need met, and we're going to get this question answered because it's about us. When we get to heaven, you know what? We're going to meet that person, that person who's going on before us. They're so involved in our life right now. Even though they're in the presence of Jesus, they're called up and looking down on us and seeing what we're doing and worried about us. We're all called up about what it is and what it looks like and what we're going to experience. We talk to people about what we read in a book or what we heard in a song or what we heard somebody talk about. What we explain looks like this life, just a little bit better. And yet Jesus says, it ain't nothing like here. That it is better than what you and I can imagine. That heaven is not about the what, and it's not about the where, but heaven is about the who, and the who is who's going to be there. And that who is God, and what we are going to do forever in his presence as the God of this universe reveals his glory and majesty to us. I will tell you that heaven's not about you, it's about him. And that's what the Bible talks about. And there's a lot of passages that we could talk about, but I, I would tell you that one of my favorites is, is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. I love the way that Paul puts it in perspective. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I love the way that Paul puts it. He says, listen, that because of God's love, because he loves us, he has shown us his mercy, his grace, which we do not deserve, and he has made us alive, truly alive in him. And this of being alive is not limited to this world, and it's limited, not limited in this world, but extends into the next world. It extends in the afterlife. And what Paul says is, is that through our union with Christ, we are already seated in the heavenly places. It's the now but not yet mentality that in God's mind, because of Christ, we're already with him in heaven, but we're just not there yet. And we say, why are we up there? Why is God bringing us there? What is the purpose of being in the heavenly places? And then he tells us in verse 7 that in the ages, in the eons, in the millennia, in the century to come, we might, he might show the exceeding riches his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I, I want you to imagine an eternity at which God keeps revealing to you over and over again his mercy and his grace and his love and his power and his majesty over and over again. Christian, what is that going to be like? I don't know. But I, I, the way that I can, I can barely wrap my mind around it is this. Christian, it's, it's the, one of the hardest things I think we try to explain, but do you, or do you have a time in your life that you have felt the Holy Spirit so strong that it was almost tangible? It may have been in a worship service or you're reading your Bible or, or you're praying or, or you're just talking about Christ. But at that moment, you knew 
that the Holy Spirit was there. It was different. It was powerful. It was tangible. Do you remember that feeling? Hard to explain, isn't it? All together, you're excited and you're overwhelmed and you're humbled and you're fulfilled and you're content and you're wore out. It's just, it's just all of this together at one time. It doesn't last very long, does it? We want it to. We want it to happen again. We pray for it again. But it doesn't last very long, does it? I want you to take that feeling and I want you to imagine that you're going to have that feeling of God's presence and his love and his majesty and his grace and it's coming to you wave after wave after wave after wave after minute by minute by hour by hour by day by day by century by century by eon by eon for age after age after age into eternity. That's what heaven is like. It ain't about us, it's about him. And how do you describe that? <laughs> Streets of gold don't cut it. So Christian, I encourage you. When you talk about heaven, talk about the way the Bible talks about it. And it's about the who and what he's going to do. It's about God and His grace and mercy being revealed to us through eternity. Talk about it that way, and it'll be enough. We talk about heaven. Don't talk about a book, a movie, a song, and don't bring your views into it. Talk about the who and what He's going to do. Because honestly, it's more than enough. So we come to the end of our text and we understand a little more what Jesus is teaching and what he's talking about and what he says about the afterlife and what comes next in the resurrected life. The question that we have is how can we respond right now? And I do believe the only way you can respond is, is respect and accept that the afterlife is about God's power and God's presence. The resurrected life is, is, is really about him and his presence and his power. It's about him. So what does that mean? Well, to me, right now, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, if you're going to accept that the afterlife, what comes next, is about his power and his presence, that means that you're going to accept there is an afterlife, and the only way you're going to have that in the presence of God is to come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Just a few moments, we're going to have an invitation. And the invitation is it's just a time for, you're invited to respond the way that the Holy Spirit is leading to you. It's just a way for you to say yes to him. Now, I do believe that the Holy Spirit is revealing to you in a way that you understand that you're separated from God because of your sin and his offer for you to come to him through faith in Christ. He makes it known to you clearly. That's what he does. During the invitation, I'm just going to encourage you to step up and step out. Follow him, say yes to him, and come down front. We'll be waiting here for you. We'd love to tell you more about Jesus and what it'll do for you now and forever. Christian, how can you respond? Well, Christian, I, I would encourage you during the, the, the time of the invitation just to praise God for the reality of the afterlife. To praise God, it ain't like this. To praise God, it's better than we could possibly ever imagine. And to make the commitment that you're going to talk about the way the Bible talks about it. And you're going to give him the glory that he deserves. As you're praying through that, if you need help, you need encouragement, we'll be down here waiting for you. You can pray with those around you. You can pray at the altar. No matter who you are today, may we all accept that there is an afterlife and it's truly about God's power and his presence. And may it impact the way that we live today and our hope for tomorrow. Father, we praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the reality of who you are. We thank you for the reality that something better is coming. A time that we will truly, truly get to experience you forever. 
And I pray, Lord, that everybody will make the decision to come to you through faith in Christ. That's, that's what you're calling. That's what you're commanding. That's what you're reaching out for. And I pray, Lord, that every believer will not settle for what we can imagine and grab a hold of what you declare. Dear God, will we not limit your power with our imagination? May we just embrace the reality of your glory and your love. All this we pray in the name of our God and King Jesus Christ. Amen.